right, so welcome back. And we are going to continue to sit at the feet of St. Theodoros the Great. But at first, um, I talked to Deacon Ed. He just returned back from Romania and he visited a lot of monasteries. He prayed for us and especially for this group at the graves of saints. And um, well, he had a lot of very good experiences. It would probably be good if he's sometimes back here visiting and if we can arrange this, it would be great if um, he would tell us about all the things, his experience from Romania. Um, uh, during the book study because it is really interesting really what he saw well for sure not all people go to church but just one experience you know that um, he met one elder and um, and he said it is amazing amazing how many people were waiting for this elder to meet him to receive his blessing just and uh, this is something what you cannot see here and experience here and uh, really this impression what he has is that Romania is a very holy country and this is true you know that probably I don't know if I told you that probably I, I did but for those who are new I can repeat that, that <coughs> We, it was 2000, oh no, it was, when it was? 2000, probably, <laughs> year. Well, I saw many years ago, <laughs> but we decided 2001, it was our first vacation, and we decided to go to Greece, uh, because we wanted to see a lot of monasteries and churches in Romania, Bulgaria, and in Greece. So we decided, okay, we will take, we will go by car. And uh, and so we spent time at sea, and then on our way back home, we will go slowly and visit all the things we were planning. When many when people heard that we want to go to Greece with by by car and to go through Romania. They said, don't do this, you know, you will take, well, there was like this fame that, well, you will, they will steal things from you, don't stop in Romania, you know, fill your uh, gas, you know, in Hungary, and just go, 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 don't stop anywhere, if you stop, just where there's a lot of light and everything, I said, oh my. So they stress us, still, but well, so we went there, we went to Romania, and for sure, after like borders, when we were waiting, like in line, there were the gypsies who went around and they were begging for things. So it was annoying, but then we just went, and suddenly we came to like smaller city. We went through the city and suddenly I saw a temperature and car went up and like some kind of smoke came from front from engine and so I stopped on the place when it was forbidden to stop one thing and I opened the trunk and I realized that the pipe which goes to when the cooler of water radiator. radiator this pipe was there was like break there I said all right it was old car, but now I had no idea what to do, <laughs> you know. And uh, my experience was that I just went to one store that was closed by us, said, I need help. And um, the lady, young lady there, she said, well, if I wait a few minutes, her boyfriend is coming, and he knows a lot of garages, and so they might help me. So I waited, and he came, he was willing to help me, so I went to his car, they stayed with me on a place, they were scared to death, the Marcel Camion. And we went to three places asking if they have a pipe, this rubber pipe. 
they didn't have this this stuff anywhere. We we were not lucky. But what I noticed is that if you enter to like these garages, you know, usually, at least it was my experience, was this tough place where there are these tough guys are and uh, probably walls are covered with interesting like uh, pictures, you know, and, but when I came to, to one garage, the first one, Immediately in front of me on the wall, there was I can tell tokos and a lampada. You know that light was. And that I said, "Oh my, this is great." And while this my new friend was talking with the owner, I saw people who came in. They crossed themselves in front of icon and they continued. I said, "Well, those people who tell me that this is a horrible place, Romania, they are wrong." And some similar repeated like in each garage so and and so you 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 have no. this ex we had this experience i had this experience that well something's going on there what you people mm. cannot see in slovakia it will be impossible i think romania has a lot of martyrs there are a lot of monks who suffered and, um, but they formed nation very well. So what the, this boom of renewal um, is now visible there. And uh, well, Deacon Edgar tell us many times. But well, with this pipe, in the end, I fixed that by myself. <laughs> you know, I, I just put a uh, plastic bag around and I use like this tape. Duct tape. It was not duct tape. <laughs> or something like that. So I, I made this. And I said, well, we'll see. Maybe if we get to Greece, I, I will be able to order and to get and replace. So we came to Greece. We returned back home. And after like three years, you know, I, I went to, go to, to fix something on the car. I said, well, change me this pipe. <laughs> so it was like another three years. So I'm pretty good in fixing things. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me plastic bag and duct tape. <laughs> We're looking for technicians at our dealerships. Yeah, <laughs> all right. You need a part-time job. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Just give me what I need and... <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, so let's continue with yeah, wasting time. So long as the soul is in a state contrary to nature, running wild with the weeds and thorns of sensual pleasures. It is a dwelling place of grotesque beasts. Isaiah's words apply to it. Asses and chars shall rest there, and hedgehogs make their lair in it, and their demons will consort with ass centaurs. For all these animals signify the various shameful passions, but the soul, so long as it is joined to the flesh, can recall itself to its natural state at any time it wishes. And whenever it does so, and disciplines itself with diligent effort, living in accordance with God's law, the wild beasts that were lurking inside it will take to flight, while the angels who guard our life will come to its aid, making the soul's return a day of rejoicing. And the grace of the Holy Spirit will be present in it, teaching its spiritual knowledge so that it may be strengthened in what is good and rise to higher levels. Yeah. Very interesting saying, and I think that it is, it's clear to understand, it's not difficult to understand this. What is interesting is, uh, I have to point that what is talking about is that this natural state and this is how Holy Fathers, they see that. Usually we, we say, well, it is natural for us that well, we are angry, natural for us that we are under, under um, some kind of rule of passions, and it's natural for us. And usually if we are more pious and, uh, and holy, we, we use this, this supernatural. But they see this like opposite, you know, that uh, what is natural holiness, 
and this unity with God, this this uh, state of um, uh, dispassion, this is natural state for us. This is how God wants us to be, how we were created. So natural is state of holiness. Everything what is different is not natural. It goes against our nature. And he says that, well, if we stay in this state of, which is so opposite of natural state, of the state holiness, so then uh, he takes this verse from Isaiah, all this, he names these uh, uh, animals as a, as a examples, I would say, of passions. So when we live in this state, so we become, our heart becomes like a nest of all these passions, bad habits, uh, uh, place where demons are present and they push us to, to do things which goes against our nature. If we don't, if we are in this state and if we are willingly staying in this state. But what he says is that, and it is, it gives us huge hope that soul can return to nature state immediately. We just need to want that. If we want to to return back and we start to uh, and we start to force ourselves to keep commandments, to live according to God's will, according to God's law, so he says that all these demons, these wild animals, will flee from our heart and uh, angels are coming and they're helping us to go to full full health and not only that spiritual knowledge starts to flow to our soul through Holy Spirit uh, to make us strong and to invite us to reach higher levels and this is something what is spiritual law. This is happening when we want. When we want. And uh, the problem is many times that we tell ourselves that yes, I want. Yes, I want. But how do we mean this that I want? Is just some kind of wish we have, or it is a thought behind that? I heard one homily, and the priest was using that. That he asked. He put this rhetorical question, do you know why we are standing during gospel? And he answered, he was just, he said, well, for sure, because of reverence towards like God's word. But he said, but well, there is another meaning there. Well, probably he made it up because I never heard, uh, heard it before. <laughs> or I, I didn't know. I, I was not paying attention. But he said, we are standing because it, the standing reminds us that we are soldiers who are receiving orders from their commandment. Commander. I said, we are standing, hearing the order and it, this order is not given to us 
to make good <coughs> feeling your soul, to be pleased, to be somehow to cause excitement. It is something what we are supposed to do. And we should uh, we should just say, he says, we should say, yes, sir, and immediately start to fulfill the order. If it is impossible during liturgy, so immediately when we go to the world. And, well, this really is something what touched me. And, uh, and if you if you think about it and you try to fulfill that, so it is a huge challenge. But this is what we are supposed to do, and uh, but we forgot this. Yes, we we want. We are saying that yes, I wish, I I want. But do we really want if we almost immediately <coughs> forget that we leave church? What kind of order was given to us? And just I think that it was through God's. Uh, some kind, I hope, inspiration because it really fits to to this theme as well as the confirmation um, on Facebook there was like two hours or three hours ago there was one one like the screenshot with words of one temporary ten, temporary contemporary, contemporary. <laughs> I like, don't like this word or elder who said that he read, besides Holy Scripture, only three books. His letter from St. John Climac, Evergetinos, and then uh, he read St. Isaac the Syrian. And he said, I never turn a page to another page until I didn't fulfill what was written on the page. And I said, well, this is something what, you know, how we should approach our spiritual life. This is something that, well, and even he says that if we force ourselves to live according to God's law, then all these demons, these wild animals, will flee. And but this, this, this is what is the, the this effort. I God, I'm getting order from God, from Christ. I receive advice from saints. Holy Fathers, you know, the, who teach us how to live gospel. So it is not just for my, some kind of my uh, to gaining new knowledge on inspiration, just to get some kind of good feeling. It is work. It is hard work. And and if we approach that this way. So then, uh, really, we will s study, for example, Theodorus, more than five years. <laughs> you know, even it's like much shorter. Mm -hmm. One priest told me that he, st he was reading this um, Isaac Syrian, and he said that he was stuck on one uh, sentence very, very early, it was about <coughs> when Isaac is talking about work of vigil, it means to this prayer in night to offering. And he said, well, it somehow it touched him and he couldn't continue. He, he knew that, well, I must do, do this, at least in some part and uh, but everything inside him was like 
turning against, well, you prayed during the day, you did all these your prayers, now now go back to the church and to take something from your sleep. So it was like, he said, two weeks. He couldn't continue because this sentence was like blaming him that he neglects something. So he said, that when, then he said, okay, or I'm going to try. He said, one hour, that's it. <laughs> or, and, yes, and it was beneficial for him, and uh, he continued to do this. And, and I think that probably in his case, this was necessary to have this experience and to to start this, this um, ascetical practice. But he, he felt this really like command. And many times we, we are touched by words of gospel in the same way they are disturbing or words of saints. And it's some, something so disturbing and we say we have really a lot of good excuses, why not? But we have to realize that it is calling which is not going to destroy our life but to elevate our life to bring this life to to higher level or to to force these demons which are in us in our hearts still to force them to flee so I I I think this this uh, uh, this text, short text, really, if we are searching for uh, some kind of simple uh, explanation, uh, w- what what is uh, spiritual life? It is in these words. To force demons flee from your heart through forcing ourselves to key to fulfill God's law, and and it has to be done with some kind of radicalism. For sure. Now, many times we we. We read that and we understand this, this orders or this suggestion from saints, and we there is a hesitation in our heart. It's it looks like impossible. It's impossible for us to do because we know ourselves. Maybe we see how busy we are. There are so many things, and and uh, maybe and sometimes even these are connections with other people can be barrier. But what they want, they they show us the way. None of them expects that we are able to make hard turn and to go opposite way immediately. What would they expect us to do? To start. To do what we can now. Maybe we are not able to do it perfectly to fulfill this, but let's try to do maximum what is in our power. And then when we make even the smallest step, there's another spiritual law, and he reminds us a little bit that um, angels will come to our help, and the uh, uh, grace of the Holy Spirit will teach us uh, the spiritual knowledge. And everything that is good in us will be strengthened and forced to grow. Higher. He is talking about this progress, and uh, we have this experience. And we talk 
about this before many times that always when we make a small step and we keep this to making these tips, uh, small steps uh, we have this experience after months, two months, three months that our taste was changed what we liked before and it, what belonged to the world is losing attractiveness it's not so attractive for us suddenly we realized that friendships we liked or we we wanted we like to hang out with some kind of people because of fun everything suddenly they don't look like very funny this attractiveness is gone and another thing what we can notice is that suddenly we start to meet people who are supporting us on this way that that really around us is growing some kind of community of new people who are trying to walk in the same way and and this is what is happening this is this help of angels help of of holy spirit yes we have to force ourselves and sometimes this forcing is is really painful but with each step we are gaining we we can taste something new we should never be afraid to to start to make these steps. Okay. Question of somebody wants to add something. Good. All right. What's another? The fathers define prayer as a spiritual weapon. Unless we are armed with it, we cannot engage in warfare, but are carried off as prisoners to the enemy's country nor can we acquire pure prayer unless we cleave to God with an upright heart. For it is God who gives power to him who prays and who teaches mass spiritual knowledge. Yeah. All right, next step. He, he continues somehow, he builds like slowly these steps in our spiritual life. So when he's talking about that we are supposed to enter to this spiritual battle, to force these demons to flee our heart and to return back to our true nature. So he immediately reminds us that we need prayer as a spiritual weapon. He said that if we are trying to do this, without prayer so we will be taken to captivity as soldiers are taken um, with enemy forces to uh, country of enemies it is really to 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 make this to enter to this process it has to be through prayer because it is God who gives us strength. Even we are talking about our effort, about our some kind of desire and our work. We we should not. It, it is it is bad if we depend on our strength everything what we are supposed to yes we are supposed to work hard or labor hard to force our will to to follow that but we have to realize that everything what is good comes from God from his grace it's not it's not uh, our strength it's not our power and and because of that we turn in the midst of this our labor, what is our fight, we turn to God uh, through prayer. And we, we realize that we depend on Him. 
everything what we are doing we are emptying our soul this our effort what we are doing is forcing our will it is this creating of um, space in our soul which can be filled with Holy Spirit with God's grace <coughs> and it, it is the same with this pure prayer we can and this experience like many many saints which who spent really hours in praying asking for help from God they were asking God and, and still but this was a special moment when they felt they that God gave them pure prayer it was not them they just created this space for God for God's grace to act in them and to give them this gift they prepared themselves uh, for receiving all this gift and uh, but in the end it is always God who gives our gifts but he, he gives gifts to those who are prepared for them so well anyway this is something what we sh should uh, be like non-stop present uh, non-stop thing of uh, weapon we are using all time because prayer keeps us away in humility that we can for example fast we can even do a lot of good things uh, through keeping the commandments <coughs> but still it might be that it can be damaged is our effort because we ascribe these things to ourselves it was I who did that. It was I who made the fault. It was I. And this is something what can, can stop God to act in our soul. Because in this, our pride, our egoism uh, is, is visible. So to pray, it means really to show God that yes I admit that I depend on you I'm doing my part I'm doing what you ask me to do but you are then that one who gives grace and the spiritual gifts and and this keeps us in a correct track in in a, it keeps our heart humble and, and it leads us it, it leads us to to uh, pure prayer too which is gift Samuel the question about prayer and in relationship to well I don't know if it's really a relationship to but the, the question in my mind about fraternal correction <coughs> uh, a lot of times I've recognized things that <coughs> were happening in front of me that I thought were an occasion to say something were usually just me um, uh, puff puffing up my own pride and um, had a lot more peace in you know the advice of the fathers is to pray for your brother instead and, and sacrifice by silence and prayer the uh, a question stills in my mind sometimes that how, I guess, how can you recognize? Um, because I think um, I think maybe partly the answer is you are trying to keep the commandments, so um, so you know when you should say something because it's required of you. Um, it has to do with you choosing uh, not to go along with somebody who's influencing you to break the commandments maybe 
Um, but uh, it's still a temptation, I think, um, to, to speak up. Um, <coughs> like somebody says something and you feel like you should warn them away from danger. But um, how can I tell if that's not what I would be doing? How can I tell if it's just uh, I'd, I'd say I'd speak up and I'd just be uh, you know acting like a know-it-all or or um, yeah. Well, I think this this. It's difficult to answer that, you know, and I really don't have, like, courage to give, like, this is this way, you know, because uh, you cannot, you cannot, uh, in, there are so many um, nuances there, and um, that it is, it is difficult to name all of them. And uh, and to describe the situations now, just several things. At first, look, uh, there there are um, situations when you must correct, uh, especially when when your state or responsibility requires it from you. For example, as a parent, as a father, well, you must correct your children. Now, and, but you know as a father that you know that uh, if you correct them from one thing again, 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 you are not going to reach the effect. You, you, as a father who loves your children, you know how to measure that correctly. You know, may it bring like uh, the result, not some kind of resistance from the child. You are not going to beat the child with that. Uh, but you insist on this. And it repeats if it is necessary. The same thing is uh, applies for everybody who are in this position of uh, responsibility, authority. So, uh, like for me, I, I must do this as a pastor for those who are in church if I see something and um, but otherwise I would be very careful to do this if there is if, if you have no authority over somebody authority would, would give you as a you have authority over your children so it is your duty uh, I would be very careful to do this because uh, until we are not really uh, purified, I mean, our heart and mind, so it's very difficult to not to let our pride or uh, yeah, to, to act in that. Oh. And, and I would, and one thing, another thing is that uh, there was, yeah, one priest he was sharing this experience, he said that there was something uh, like during liturgy, <coughs> you know, happening in his parish. And it was like each each uh, liturgy he was like in this temptation okay announcements and I will tell how it should be um, but still in the end when the announcement came he said oh not today not today let's pray about it more and he said it took like two months and then he said, and then it disappeared. You know that he he was annoyed by that, but well, 
he's he was trying, uh, let's let's pray let's pray for the ask God for help let's, uh, because he didn't want to make to cause some kind of he said somebody can be touched I cannot say this like personally you you are the one you know and it disappeared and many times we have this experience that we have we see a problem that well and there is a this temptation in us to fix that and and many times we are right it is problem it is it is really right and and but my recommendation would be just be patient you know ask god for that uh, well sometimes we have to ask who am i to try to fix the other i we really don't know we are so unique each of us and uh, many times there are so many these influences which cause the how we act and many times if we know everything what what caused this acting of the others we would we would tolerate that i said well it's okay that person went through so many bad things or so many um tough situation which made these scars in the souls so i am not going to add another one <clears throat> but if we ask god and we tell god about that and we ask for salvation of soul that person i think this is something what what will many times it will disappear by itself and be sold like another example is from life of uh, Porphyrios elder Porphyrios from Greece he was a monk who lived in the center of Athens and he was like uh, spiritual father for one hospital there was a corridor uh, hospital corridor main and in the end was like there was a chapel there when he served the liturgies and on this corridor not only people were going there were like some kind of stores there and there was one store when uh, where they were selling um, record this round what is like record yeah and that that um, owner of the shop he was playing this very loudly you know the songs and the Porfirio said, well, when he started liturgy and suddenly this, this, this songs, this music from above, and, and it was annoying for him. And he had this like, so I have, after liturgy, I have to go to there and talk to him that in time of liturgy, he should not uh, play this music. And... Uh, then later in liturgy, a thought came. He, he told him, so if you were play, praying well, you would not hear the music. So instead going to him to say, stop playing music, he started to make repentance that he is not enough attentive to the liturgy. And from that, that day on, it was like this music was forced him reminder, be attentive what you are praying. And after a while, I, I don't remember how long it was, but not really long, that, that owner of the shop, he stopped to play. <laughs> and actually, he uh, really uh, finished his job, that the store was closed. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was really good. So God will take care. Sometimes through this, many times God tells us something that we want to correct somebody else. But actually, it is message for us, Patrick. I'm not sure how good I mean how good this or bad this is, but I was in an office once at one of our dealerships, and 
uh, this gentleman was in there and he was using the name of Jesus and the name of God in every sentence. You know, just using it in vain. And one of, the, one of the mechanics came in and this guy said something to him and he goes, how are you? He goes, well, I'm fine, but we're going to have a problem if you t keep taking God's name in vain. And the guy stopped it. Okay? And I thought, what a witness that was. So it got to a point where if somebody uses God's name in vain, I'll just say, please leave him out of this, you know, or he's got nothing to do with this, or say it some yeah. other way. Yeah. And now, a lot of my coworkers, if they slip, they'll turn to me and say, sorry. I said, <laughs> I'm not the one to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the light to tell them. <laughs> so I don't know if that's good or bad, but I mean, I didn't pound on them or anything like that, but it also reminds me not to use that language, you know, not to take God's name in vain. But Sometimes you can make a joke. I said, yeah. I march you. I'm going to make a report. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> to my boss. That's right. Tell my boss. It's, it, this is amazing, something, you know, and I, while you were, when you were talking about that, came to mind that uh, one seminary, and my friend, he said that the seminary he was working, and there was, he, so he come, uh, he said that, his job was, I well, actually he had to come to garage, you know that place when these uh, drivers of trucks were sitting and preparing for daily jobs, and he was supposed to bring them some kind of papers, uh, they are what they are supposed to do, etc., and other things. He said, "Oh my, this was like." To go there, it was like to go like to like worst pub, you know, in the city. But he, he was forced to spend time with with them, and suddenly he started to notice after several months that if he came, they stopped to use these dirty words, you know. And uh, fun, the funniest part was that uh, he said he brought from home something to fix, uh, to ask them, they, are, they had skills, you know, can you fix from me? He said. So he started to work on this and something happened, he hit or so. I said, oh my, I even cannot swear when you are here. <laughs> <laughs> and this might, be, this might be answer. Is it answer yeah. for you? Uh, part of the thrust of my question I was recognizing as we were talking is that there, our culture is that you, you should have the boldness to say something every time. And so I find myself fighting against that or conflicted in trying to decide. Um, but it makes sense that uh, usually the uh, silence and the reliance on God to take care of my brother is the uh, is what God's asking for me. That's why He showed me the uh, the problem. Yeah, man. Well, it, but I think that more we are growing in this um, spiritual knowledge, or I would say in holiness. Um, uh, I think that this thing becomes clearer and clearer for us when to speak. And but if we speak and it is like we know now it is the right time to say this, and we don't do it really for um, just to correct, but it's like urge some kind. I, I, it's difficult to explain, but we know, and we we do it with um, special words, I would say. There was a priest I listened to who said that, uh, you know, how Paul says, I could wish myself cast off for the sake of my brothers, the Jews. He says, if you don't have an attitude like that, then you shouldn't correct your brother. Yeah. I would agree with that. That's, that, least... that's that care and concern for the other that's yes. pushing you to speak. Yes. But it is it is difficult to find a good balance. But uh, 
uh, I think that even like in this position, I said, well, as a parent, as a priest, as a teacher, as a uh, what kind of a position of authority it is, even that we should not abuse that authority. Uh, and uh, I think that like this Porphyrios, um, he was in charge of this spiritual care in this, this hospital, so he had the right to go there and to create correct environment. But um, but the same Porphyrios was saying, like when people come to spiritual advice or counsel, uh, when there were like mothers, they they came and they said, "Well." Uh, problems with children and uh, so he said uh, well if you want to correct your children talk to God more about your children than to children about his and her faults wise advice you know and uh, we should always be very careful uh in this movement of correction of others. I think the, you... Uh, I, what I'm trying to say, I am saying not to do... St- just just ignore, to be ignorant. But really, this fight should start on knees, on our knees, you know, for that, for that person to pray or to really searching our our own souls you know like this Porphyrios he he in this moment he realized some or he recognized something what was missing in his way of prayer so uh, all right we have a few minutes left so I Let's not continue. Let's make this book study longer. <laughs> no, I, I think that another is important too, so I don't want to just to go through. But we have a few minutes left. That somebody has question or something, even not connected with this topic. to ask I guess I was I didn't understand the discussion that we have just had that you all just had um, we were talking about speaking up as some sort of a response to some sort of behavior but I didn't see I, I didn't really understand the limits of the actions we were talking about. You know, there are uh, all sorts of times when one should do something and all sorts of times when one shouldn't. And it, and we've spoken also of our modern culture. Our modern culture has become grayer and grayer in terms of thing of of when you ought to do something and when you ought to do something. And it's become grayer and grayer, I think, because it's it's a secular, anti-Christian culture. So in terms of the behavior of people, the authority of the person speaking seems nowadays to have to do with uh, well with the, what's what that authority is based on. Now um, so for instance so for instance I was at a uh, uh, ten years ago I was taking a break on a job I was doing in Oakland, California, next to the courthouse, and uh, just taking a break. I was a cup of coffee. I was a smoker. And 
and uh, a woman walked by me, and then a young woman, the young man walked by me quickly, yelling at this woman. Um, and I thought, oh, it looked like he might attack her. And so I, spe I walked up quickly to about 15 feet away from them and just stood there wondering what, the, what I'm doing. Should I do something? And a fellow came, at that point another man, an older man, came running out of the court, courthouse yelling at them across the street uh, trying to distract the young man who was really, really hot. And, um, and uh, you know, I was glad that guy came along because, uh, you know, in, in the, the culture of 50 years ago that I was brought up in, which is, was a subculture, I was taught certain things by my parents, uh, and one of which was, you know, that other gentleman who didn't come, yes, I absolutely have to do something. Well, sure. And so I didn't, so going to, to your question, I wasn't sure, well, I don't, I'm not sure what kind of situation we're talking about. There are certainly situations that the culture thinks you should be quiet, Samuel, you Christian. And uh, uh, and these things used to be a lot better cut and dry uh, in, the, in the culture, because it was a Christian culture. Oh. Um. Well, you know that one thing is that um, I think that Samuel was talking about if somebody is acting as a, as a defect of under some compassion, not correctly. You are talking about uh, acting which can which can cause problem, injury to somebody else. For sure, it would be funny if somebody is in danger that we, and that we, we just kneel down and start to pray. Mm -hmm. You know, we we are supposed to <coughs> to defend innocent. You know, Th this is this for sure. And I think this was not this uh, area Simula was talking about. Yeah, my, my worry is like. A defect of character, and you look at that and think, well, that could lead to a trickle down effect of, well, that could lead to worse and worse behavior or bad judgment uh, or under the influence of somebody who I think is, you know, uh, not a good influence. And so my concern would be should I give my opinion or give a warning, um, making a judgment, you know making a judgment and presenting it to them. I think it depends on how you do that, because you can go to somebody and you're correcting them and you're knocking them down, right. but if you go to them without uh, uh, accusing them or anything. Yeah, it, does, it definitely depends. <laughs> yeah. But still, I would be careful with that too, you know. Careful because uh, I think that uh, uh, many times uh, we are risking that in this, this goodwill we are letting our pride to talk, At, and this is not ex accepted. Of being or this position of superiority, and it, it is really uh, I would. Avoid and I think that parents who have uh, children who are growing teenagers, you know that many times it is uh, for you despise all, all good advices and trying to raise them. There are sometimes times, even years when you are just asking God for help because you cannot do anything. And you know that there is no word which can help. They, they, 
and and but if you spend time if you give your child again into God usually it turns well in the end but sometimes even people uh, even God allow them to go through experience of of this fruits of their bad acting and it has purpose mm. look that young man from uh, this young, prodigal son when he took this proper um, property, not proper, money from father, his heritage, and he started to go to this far land. Let's think about that. How many people might try to stop him, tell him that you are asshole, <laughs> that you are doing that, you know? You are to do what you are doing to your father, what you are doing, you know. And would he listen? Even if father would send like messengers and some come to him when he was in this far country, he would not listen. He needed to touch this bottom of misery to come to senses. And this we have to have still in mind that, well, I, I, I really don't want that, I don't want to tell that not to be ignorant or let that person be, you know, we should fight over the person we see in prayer to keep, to bring the person to God. But many times we don't know what is the best for the person. Yes, in our mind it is, well, but but we cannot force. And and many, uh, it's complicated, you know, because many times we can feel clearly in our soul, in our mind, that this is God's will to say something, and we know immediately correct words to say, and they will help. We have so many uh, experiences with that too. But still, I will be careful because to make good discernment, um, it's it's quite difficult. And many times we make it. in this decision we make more mistakes than good decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you.